Hi everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Um, we'll start out with a study that I'm sure you have heard about. It made a lot of noise about supplements and cardiovascular disease and that sort of thing. Um, a new meta-analysis, 179 studies, uh, shows that the four most commonly used dietary supplements, multivitamins, vitamin D, calcium, and vitamin C, have no effect on cardiovascular outcomes and none of them reduce the risk of all-cause mortality. The most studied nutrient, vitamin D, which was the subject of 43 randomized controlled trials, had no benefit. There was a slight risk reduction from taking folic acid and B-complex vitamins for stroke reduction. That's the only benefit they could find out of 179 studies. There was a, quote, marginally significant increase in the risk of all-cause mortality with combination products. Notice I said increase in the risk of all-cause mortality with combination products which included two or more of vitamins A, C, and E, beta-carotene, selenium, zinc, and extended-release niacin when taken by patients who were also taking statin drugs. The authors note that the strength of their review is that it basically provided updated information from assessments and reports from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force um, with a, more of a focus on cardiovascular outcomes like myocardial infarction, stroke, and mortality. The authors wrote that, quote, overall health benefits were expected from taking supplements since, quote, a significant proportion of Western diets are not optimal, and it has been reasoned that supplementation could rectify potential deficiencies. If there are no potential adverse effects to supplementation, then it can be argued that some benefits might have been seen, but as yet they have not. Now, the reason I included that quote there is I want you to understand, and this is often the case, that in most situations, the researchers who do studies looking at dietary supplements are not starting out as advocates for supplements or um, or have a bias against supplements. They're basically starting out asking the question, we should look into this and see what it says. They're not starting out saying, let's see if we can make the dietary supplement business look bad. So um, they tried to look for a benefit, they couldn't find it. Now what I find really interesting is the response from the supplement industry. It's, it's predictable. Um, spokespersons are saying that people should still take their supplements. Andrea Wong, Vice President of Scientific and Regulatory Affairs for the Council for Responsible Nutrition says, quote, we have to remember that these supplements provide nutrients. They are not intending to prevent cardiovascular disease, so we should not expect the data to show that. Okay, so you're just taking them for nutrients, is that the idea? She went on to say, there is definitely a need for supplementation. The comments that have come from the publication of this study that Americans can get all the nutrients they need from food is not accurate and is unrealistic. Several of the nutrients included in this analysis have been identified as shortfall nutrients. And I think this is a really curious stance to take. The supplements are useless and sometimes harmful, but people should take them anyway? Really? Well, to be clear, some supplements are useful for some people under some circumstances, but there's little money to be made in only recommending supplements to people who will benefit. Uh, more profit can be made when everybody can become convinced that they're a candidate to take these dietary supplements. Um, the challenge is to make sure that you're the person who's going to get some benefit, more benefit than harm, uh, if a supplement is recommended to you. And I guess my closing comment about this particular issue is I find it interesting that the alternative health community shares a lot more in common with the traditional medical community than they would like to acknowledge sometimes. And what I mean by that is one of the things that I talk about all the time in these videos and in the books that I write and everything else is the tendency of the medical profession to do the same thing. You can't really make billions of dollars on bypass surgery if you just do bypass surgery on patients who are going to benefit. You've got to find a way to get a half a million people to have bypass surgery every year. The same thing is true with statin drugs. They are helpful for some people, but there's not a, no billions of dollars to be made if you just prescribe them for the people who benefit. So with all of these things, I mean, the health care bill would shrink like you can't believe in this country if we just did things to people that were good for them, that would actually benefit. But no, we have to make it available and tell every, talk everybody into thinking that they need it. All right, second topic for today. This is um, by popular demand. Uh, many of you wrote to me after the American Cancer Society changed its guidelines when to begin um, colorectal screening and uh, colorectal cancer screening. And so um, I thought I would cover that and tell you my, my thoughts about it and give you some directions. So here's the story. The American Cancer Society recently changed its guidelines concerning screening for colorectal cancer. And what they did was they lowered the recommended age to start screening from 50 down to 45. 
The reason that was stated for this change is the increased incidence of colorectal cancer in younger and younger people. Um, people who are at increased risk of colorectal cancer, such as those who have a family history, personal history of colorectal cancer or inflammatory disease, uh, are advised that they should start screening at an even younger age. At this time, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has not changed its recommendations, which remain starting at the age of 50. The task force did look at the issue a few years ago and determined that evidence did not clearly show a benefit for uh, lowering the age at which screening is started down to 45. Now, to its credit, the American Cancer Society offers several screening alternatives and doesn't exclusively promote colonoscopy. There was a time when they did. Options include a stool-based test, such as the fecal immunochemical test, or FIT, or a visual exam, such as colonoscopy, CT colonography, or flexible sigmoidoscopy. The ACS recommends that anybody who has a positive stool test then graduate to get a colonoscopy as soon as possible once the test comes back positive. Now, the data are not yet clear that this is going to save lives or money, either one, uh, which are the justifications, some of the justifications which have been offered for the change. Early detection saves lives is the mantra of the cancer screening industry, but with the exception of PAP tests, which have reduced the risk of dying of cervical cancer, this has not been proven to be true. The only real way you're going to reduce the risk of death from cancer in any kind of meaningful way is to focus on prevention, which means you've got to work on optimal diets, exercise, and weight loss. I think the ACAS could have made a significant impact on reducing the risk of death from colon cancer by issuing a statement that reflected the facts, which are that younger people are developing colon cancer at a younger age because of their poor diet and lifestyle habits and poor health status. And the only way to effectively address this is to improve both habits and health. But ACS didn't do this. The organization remains steadfast in its commitment to the traditional oncology model, which involves the use of mostly ineffective screening tests and treatments, and a significant percentage of those treatments have absolutely no efficacy. No doubt these new guidelines will motivate a few million people to have some form of screening for colorectal cancer, and so I thought what I would do is include some guidelines here that if you are going to get screened, some things you should keep in mind. There is not a single randomized controlled trial that shows that colonoscopy reduces your risk of dying of colon cancer. Serious complications occur in five out of a thousand people and perforation occurs in one out of a thousand procedures. In order to save one life, 1,250 people have to have a colonoscopy and one person is harmed or dies for every person who is saved. In 2016, the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Healthcare updated its recommendations for colon cancer screening, stating, quote, it does not recommend using colonoscopy as a primary screening test for colorectal cancer due to lack of evidence, end of quote. Instead, the task force recommends fecal occult blood test or fecal, fecal immunochemical test, or FIT, every two years for adults aged 60 to 74, or every 10 years with flexible sigmoidoscopy. Notice that their guidelines are to start testing at an earlier, or a later, much later age, 60 to 74. Now, a little information about the FIT test. It's my preference uh, as opposed to the fecal occult test. Um, it's a home stool test that requires no liquids to clean out the colon, no sedatives, no anesthesia. There is almost no risk. It diagnoses 79% of cancers with a single test. A systematic review concluded that, quote, this systematic review and meta-analysis suggests that FITs have high accuracy, high specificity, and moderately high sensitivity for detection of CRC. An analysis of the evidence concerning colon cancer screening concluded, quote, currently, fecal occult blood test and flexible sigmoidoscopy have the highest levels of evidence to support their use for colorectal cancer screening. Colonoscopy does not have a proven colorectal cancer mortality benefit, but it does have the, biggest, uh, the greatest single test accuracy. It's the final test in the pathway to evaluate and treat patients with other abnormal screening tests. So to summarize, evidence does not support uh, the use of colonoscopy as an initial screening test for colorectal cancer. It may have some value for follow-up screening. FIT and sigmoidoscopy are better options, but remember, your best option for reducing your risk of developing or dying of colorectal cancer is to focus on prevention, optimal habits, and weight loss instead of early detection. So I hope that provides some needed information and guidance based on new guidelines and um, gives you some idea of how to proceed from here. That's all for today and all for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it and I'll be back to you next week with more news.